2022 lecture series, the post-apocalyptic lectures. So, all right. I have the, all the information out there for our upcoming stuff. Our 10th anniversary is a brick and mortar, is on 11 11. We've got some stuff happening with that. If you have any questions, just come see me. So, without any further ado, I'll hand it over to Chip Barry here. All right. Thank, thank you, everybody, for coming. Appreciate you coming on and coming up in a crummy afternoon. So, the presentation about Michigan Aviation, which I've got up here, available for sale after a discount <laughs> if you're so inclined, there's certainly no obligation to buy. Uh, as Chris noted, my name is Barry Levine. I'd like to thank him and the Michigan Military Technical and Historical Society for having me and you folks for coming. Just by way of background, my father was in the Army Air Force in World War II up in the Aleutians. Only thing he shot at was from reindeer and uh, caribou for fresh meat. The Japanese had already been thrown out of the island by the time they had arrived there. Uh -huh. He came home, so that's the main thing. I'm a volunteer at the Yankee Air Museum in Belleville, and I have been since 2015. I've written two books. Uh, the first one is Yankee Air Museum, an Arcadia book here, and then Michigan Aviation, which I have published this summer. Uh, what I find is aviation history is both fascinating and rewarding, but it often deals with ambiguous and inconsistent information, so I sorted it out as best I could. I'd like to thank all the people that you see on the screen for their support, starting with my family, Carol, Dan, and Jessica. They didn't support it, no books. And I'd also like to thank, you know, some of the people and organizations there for the content that we'll be talking about tonight, which is certainly not all the book, it's some excerpts from the book. And a special note of thanks to the Yankee Air Museum. Because I started volunteering there in 2015, and I used to flatter myself that I knew something about aviation history when I showed up there. What I found was I was wildly optimistic about how much I knew. Guests come in and they've always got a wealth of information. The staff there, other volunteers, they share stories and background, their perspectives, and there's just a ton there. And I'm just going to scratch the surface. It's two, two stories for tonight. Both involve the Strategic Air Command of Michigan's aviation history, which is a small sample of the total story throughout Michigan. Part one talks about a B-52 crash off of Charlevoix in Little Traverse Bay in January 1971. Nine airmen lost their lives in that incident. Could have been an environmental disaster as the target was a big rock nuclear power plant and they were only five miles north of it and they were about one minute's flight time from the uh, reactor. Part two deals with the strategic air command bases in northern Michigan, including Kinchlow, Wordsmith and Sawyer, much more on those coming up. First topic is the B-52 crash, which occurred on January 7th, 1971, and that's a headline from the next day's paper in Potosi or Traverse City. A combination of the Cold War, intense training levels by the Strategic Air Command, U.S. interest in nuclear power, which was seen as a wave of the future, including a plant at Charlevoix, uh, the use of radar bomb scoring technology, which is used to measure bomb crew accuracy, and the use of Asian B-52C aircraft for training missions, all a part of it. After World War II, there were ongoing tensions between the United States, uh, China, and the uh, USSR, as well as their satellites, including the Berlin Airlift, the Korean War, the Bay of Pigs, the Cuban Missile Crisis, a very close call with World War III, Laos and Vietnam, and it was a constant concern that any or all of these could lead to an exchange of nuclear weapons with the Soviets. The Strategic Air Command it was part of the U.S. offensive strategy and would attack Soviet targets with nuclear weapons if so ordered by the President. SAC bases were located all over the U.S., including Westover Air Force Base, which is near Springfield, Massachusetts, and that's part of tonight's story. It's named after Oscar Westover, who was the Army Air Force Chief in the 30s. He's from Bay City, Michigan. B-52 Stratofortress was a key part of the U.S. arsenal. First flown in 1952, it's a monster aircraft with eight jet engines, weighed over 450,000 pounds of fully loaded, and could carry up to 70,000 pounds of ordnance. With mid-air refueling, could reach tar <coughs> targets anywhere in the world. Typically had a six-man crew. B-52C models were delivered to the Air Force in 1956 and 57. The Air Force had a series of upgrades and change requests leading through the B-52H models. This cockpit is the inside of the B-52 we have out at Yankee. 
it's not generally it's not open to the public, but some of the guys that work on it let me in, so I took a peek, and it's uh, that's what it looks like, and that's pretty much what the sea cockpits look like. Meanwhile, nuclear power is part of the equation behind the tragedy. The first U.S. nuclear power plant came online in 1958 in Pennsylvania. As a kid back home in Connecticut, toured the Yankee, uh, Connecticut Yankee plant in the 1960s. It was seen as a limitless amount of energy. We, they gave all the kids a comic book of, sort of talking about the wonders of nuclear power. I wish I had kept it. It would be a neat collector's piece. Anyhow, locally, Consumers Power decided to build a new plant near Charlevoix near Big Rock, which is a geologic formation that was used by, as a gathering place by Native tribes. Its formal name was the Big Rock Point Nuclear Power Plant. I don't know the name of the guy sitting up there on top of that rock. Construction began in 1960 and was completed in 1962. The plant was used for research, power generation. It also produced Cobalt 60, which is used for, uh, treat for medical treatments such as cancer. The greenish blue dome on the right was a target for the January 1971 mission. So you can already see this <clears throat> the seeds of the disaster using a nuclear reactor dome as a target for a B-52 mission. In hindsight, it may not have been that smart of an idea. <laughs> there was a promotional video in 1962 you can find it on YouTube. With Ronald Reagan, back when he was working for GE as a spokesperson before he became governor and before he became president. It was a big tourist attraction in the area. Over 500,000 people had come through by 1968. Concurrently with the nuclear mission, uh, was radar bomb squadrons were known by the acronym RDS. <coughs> SAT, the Strategic Air Command, relentlessly trained its crews. The sample mission would include bombing runs on targets similar to what the airmen would find if they had to attack the Soviet Union, such as a nuclear power plant. To measure accuracy, the Air Force used radar bomb scoring, which involved electronic signals tuned from the bomber to the ground crew who tracked the results. This is an aerial view of the Art Base or RBS station. These photos are a couple interior shots. The facility had been in Ironwood and then moved in 1963 to Bayshore, which is just off of US 31. The folks have been on vacation up there. It's designated as the first combat evaluation group detachment six. It was small, there was no base housing, there was no food service. Some local newspaper references talked about the RBS being up the road from a convenience store. So it sounds like it's up the road from 7 Eleven, so maybe these guys came down with a good gulp or whatever they had available in the 70s. <laughs> they would also reference a few stray dogs running around the neighborhood. So it seems kind of casual given the seriousness of what they were doing. Personnel lived in area towns. They used the Charlotte Boy High School gym to work out on Saturday mornings. We were concerned before the crash. This is not Photoshop. This is a B-52 in the day flying over a nuclear power plant at obviously a very low altitude. The didn't target the RBS facility itself as the electronic signature was not good, so they used the reactor as a target. <coughs> Area residents complained about the noise and safety concerns, no surprise there. The Air Force essentially said, tough, we need this for national security. Congressman Jerry Ford, as House Minority Leader, wrote a letter on behalf of Consumers Power to the Air Force, noting increased insurance premiums to the, uh, to the power company three weeks before the crash. All that set the stage for Hiram 16, the code name for that night's mission from Westover. Nine crew were on board. Very complimented as than usual. Some of these guys were on, or flew the mission for training purposes. All were highly skilled, capable airmen. Some, and possibly all of them, were Vietnam veterans. Lieutenant Colonel William Lemon was the aircraft commander, had outstanding proficiency reports. All nine of the men were married, and there were 17 children between the nine marriages. So the mission of that night was to fly from Westover, hit four targets electronically, and then return home. And other tasks, such as mid-air refueling, were on the checklist. Should have been a routine training mission, although in my mind that's an oxymoron moron of the phrase because there's no such thing as a routine B-52 mission. Flying at high speeds, the, the crews are often exhausted. Very complex aircraft, much could go wrong, and there was a high pace of operation, so the ground crews were stressed as well. And if you look at the literature, there are any number of B-52 crashes, both here in the States and overseas. 
B-52s, when they flew on missions, such as OB-9, OB stands for oil burn. If you've seen B-52 with low altitudes, they often leave black smoke exhaust coming out of their engines. That's the phrase oil burner, shortened to the acronym OB. OB-9 included a pass over Big Rock up here in the northwestern Michigan. Mission took off from Westover before 2 o'clock in the afternoon on January 7, 71. Weather wasn't a factor, there wasn't any problem with ice or snow or anything. Those four targets were to be bombed in Big Rock, codenamed Charlie, was the fourth of four targets that night. Lemon's B-52 had many air hours, given SAC's extensive training program. An added complication, B-52s were originally designed for high altitude missions. As Soviet air defenses improved, lower altitude flights became the norm. I'm not an uh, aeronautics engineer by any stretch of the imagination, but from what I've read, low altitude flying on metal components of wings leads to increases in metal fatigue, which becomes part of the story. By 6.30 that night, three out of four targets had been bombed. The RBS operators then saw a large blip in an absolute stone-cold silence from Harbor 16. There was no distress call of any sort. The bomber was traveling at about 350 miles an hour, so a little simple math will be about one minute's flight time from where it was that nuclear reactor. The next day's headlines look something like this. There was a huge explosion and fireball from the fuel board when it impacted the water about five miles north of Big Rock in Little Trapper's Bay. Residents said it looked like a sunset, but it was in the wrong direction, and at 6.30 at night in northern Michigan should be pitch black. No light, no natural light at all. Almost shook as if an earthquake had occurred. An off duty RBS airman was at home, saw the flash and heard the explosion. He and a friend went to the lake shore and thinking a freighter had exploded, and that wasn't the case. Ken Chillow received a call from one of his gunners about the crash. He said it wasn't one of our planes, but they all went down to the ready room to wait for news, and it was a long, sad night. Anyhow, the wreckage covered a wide area. No human remains were ever recovered. We searched for a few weeks and then there was a blizzard up there, so they called out the search in springtime. The Navy and a private salver searched for wreckage. <coughs> Remnants were sent to Kinslow for investigation. Kinslow airmen were asked if they would volunteer to search the shore for wreckage, and a number did so. U.S. on well, that is the site of the crash there. The U.S. Coast Guard cutter Mackinac, if you've ever been up to Mackinac City, I'm sure you've seen the boat as a museum piece on shore. That was part of the search. An inspection by Boeing, Boeing and the Air Force concluded metal fatigue in the wing between the first and second engine pod caused part of the wing to fall off. The B-52 would thus be totally uncontrollable in that kind of situation. It was a complete shock to the Westover community. Families and friends had to deal with this nightmare. The families heard essentially nothing from the Air Force, so there was little closure. And there were some rumblings of pilot error. <clears throat> blaming Lemon, the pilot, but it was simply not true, and there was no way for Lemon to defend himself. There was a July 1971 memorial at Charlevoix. Air Force figure included a, a F-106 is in a missing man formation. These aircraft are, are not F-106s, but it gives you the idea. <coughs> a few people played taps, so it must have been a pretty emotional and moving ceremony for all concerned. Ultimately, the Air Force grounded all the remaining B-52Cs, to include another tragedy of this sort. There were rumors in the area of hydrogen bombs, similar to this, that, that are in the bay to this day, simply not true. The B-52, simply not true. The B-52 carried no bombs of any type. Or there were accidents such as what led to this picture. A KC-135 and a B-52 collided in 1966 off Spain dropping four hydrogen bombs, either in the Mediterranean or in the village of Palomares. All four weapons were recovered, none detonated, but some of the conventional explosives on the bombs did go off, scattering <coughs> plutonium dust over the countryside. So thank you, Air Force. Despite all this, SAC wanted to continue these missions. The Cold War was still going on. Ralph Nader wrote a letter to the Atomic Energy Commission, why weren't the flight stop sooner? And then there was an investigation resulting in answering the question, what if the wreckage actually hit the reactor, what would have happened? So the findings were they didn't think the reactor would be compromised after B-52 crashes on top of it. <coughs> you, 
you be the judge of that. The Air Force did agree to a wider track around Good Rock uh, and ended direct overhead flights. Bayshore was decommissioned in 1984. Big Rock was decommissioned in the late 1990s. There's still nuclear material on site. I can't imagine good folks in East Point would want nuclear waste down here for storage. It's buried underground, under armed guard. Who knows where it's going to end up? I think it's going to be there for a long time. If the reactor was compromised, consider this. You might recall the terrible tsunami in Japan in 2011 causing equipment failure at the Fukushima reactor in that year. No deaths were directly attributed with the reactor, but it was a huge economic dislocation. People had to evacuate and they slowly returned home over years. Consider the potential in a 50 mile radius around Charlevoix in Tosca. Loss of life, environmental damage, economic ruin. What if you had to close the bridge? What's your backup plan for that? Tourism, agriculture, to me, the entire local economy seems to really be devastated. Yes, sir. Was there anything ever said about the nuclear plant down near uh, For me? uh, Southeast Michigan near Monroe? Yes, Fermi, that's a whole separate body of literature, which I'm not in the book and I don't address it. Yeah. Okay. I'm not from here, but my wife is, and she recalls it well when uh, I had all the uh, report issues. Now, there's a guy named Rick Wiles, who's a local historian and teacher of Tosky helped organize a 2011 memorial <coughs> 40 year anniversary. And he was a big help to me with the story. He mentioned the irony of these Vietnam veterans surviving combat missions in Southeast Asia and then returning home and being killed in a training accident. This ceremony was attended by uh, Russo's widow and daughters, all appreciated his efforts and helped bring closure to the family. So, who were these guys? Major Don Russo is from Morgantown, West Virginia. Flew over a hundred wild weasel missions in Vietnam with them to take out sand, miss sand missiles. Lieutenant Doug Bachman was a co pilot. He was from Highland Park, New Jersey. Littered in three sports uh, in high school, attended Rutgers, and then joined the Air Force. His friends back home set up a memorial fund in his honor. A friend of mine, a Yankee, was one of his frat brothers at Rutgers. And this is a picture of Tech Sergeant Jerry Atchie, who was a gunner was from Ocean City, Washington. He served on AC 47s, which are gunships in Vietnam. So, another very high risk occupation, the way to lose your life when you got killed in this. This photo was posted by a woman named Elizabeth Ashley Bove, his wife, or his daughter. I don't know. But it is, I do know, I, you just can't imagine the grief ever going away from these, from these families. Anyhow, the fa family members of the crew gathered with Westover senior leadership in 2018. Unveiling this memorial painting by an airman named Bill Pope. And there's a memorial marker still up on Route 31 on Lake Michigan Road Shore, Roadside Park. It's photos from 2020, it'd be easy to overlook it. And you look out at a peaceful scene in Little Traverse Bay. It was a beautiful day when we were there. And then you picture a B 52 falling out of the sky and exploding a few miles away, and you just can't imagine it, but it happened. That's part one. Part two deals with the SAC base in Michigan, with a focus on Kinslow Air Force bases, or represented the other two. Michigan has three such bases. This is Kinslow's flight line, and the winter scene, obviously. Wordsmith, down in Oscoda, named after Detroit's General Paul Wordsmith, was recognized by Douglas MacArthur for his efforts in World War II. Uh, Wordsmith was killed in a plane crash in 1946. And then K.I. Sawyer, that's Ken Sawyer on the left, he was a prominent up in uh, the UP in the early part of the 20th century, and that's part of the uh, today's museum. I have to know that's uh, during the base days. It's a Greek museum. All these bases had small beginnings before World War II, <coughs> significantly ramped up in size, personnel, and facilities during the Cold War. When the Cold War ended, with budget cuts, all three bases were closed with huge impact on local economies. All three of these locations made significant contributions to the national defense and to Michigan. The early days, the Sioux Locks, Kinslow is about 20 miles south of Sioux St. Marie, just off of I-75. Kinross Auxiliary Airfield was built in World War II to defend the locks, and which were seen as critical to national defense. Field reverted to civilian control after the war, and the Air Force regained authority as the Cold War started ramping up 
It became Kinross Air Force Base in 1952. It's also Rappo Army Airfield was part of Kinchlow, about 20 miles northwest of Kinross off of Route 28. Rappo Ackerman came from Richardson Navy Sawmill in the 19th century. The area was a civilian conservation corps camp during uh, the 30s and became an auxiliary airfield in World War II. It was activated in 1960 as the Kinslow Air Force Base Bowmark site, and the Bowmark name combines Boeing and the Michigan Aero Research Center, which was the first long-range anti-aircraft missile ever deployed at Racco and other U.S. locations. That part was developed at Willow Run Airport during, as part of the Michigan uh, Aero Research Center. The Packard hangar is still standing, and it's across the site from Willow uh, Air Museum's future hangar. Yes, sir. Yeah, at one point, too, if I remember correctly, Bowmarks were known to have both uh, conventional and nuclear warheads. You better believe it. They had, it, had either or both, and there were a bunch here in southeast Michigan, too. They weren't just up in the north. I wouldn't be surprised. Also, the... Uh, Suffers had one. I know yeah. that. Uh, also, when they had the uh, Nike Hercules sites for the Army, Yep. Uh, those were all the Nike Hercules were uh, nuclear warheads. Yep. Rotiel had them. So, were, as you noted, <coughs> Two guys on what they're breaking the sweat right at the moment. They know that there were eight men on station in the mid 60s. Cook came on Friday afternoon, and he or she stayed until Monday morning. And I guess the guys had leftovers during the week. These had drag races on the old runways, which they said was barely getting lost in the forest. In the late 1950s, Michigan's Ivan Kinslow becomes part of the story. He's from Detroit, born in 1928, and grew up in Kosopolis. Graduated to Washiak High in 1945, which is near Battle Creek. He was a top U.S. Air Force pilot. He was an ace during the Korean War with five enemy fighters shot down. He was a test pilot. He went up on an X 2 in 1956 to 50 miles high. Some consider Ivan Kinchlow our country's first astronaut because he was on the boundaries of outer space. In any event, he was killed in July 1958 when the engine in his jet failed. He ejected too low to the ground and the chute failed. Ooh. Ken Ross was renamed Kinslow in 1959. The ceremony was attended by his parents and his widow. He was inducted into the Michigan Aviation Hall of Fame in 1996 and the National Aviation Hall of Fame in 2011. Air Defense Command was on base at all three locations. Its mission was for detection, interception, identification, and if necessary, destruction of hostile aircraft in defense of the continental U.S. It was a huge effort, about 110,000 military and civilian personnel were involved in the mid 60s. Called out about once a week for unknown incidents in the Sioux area. They had alert radars at various locations in Michigan, such as Sioux St. Marie. There are up there, there's a Walmart up there, which we've driven by. And I think not too far down the road from the Walmart is the abandoned ADC site, I think. I'm not sure. Their goal was five minutes from the alert to takeoff in case the Soviets penetrated outer air defenses. <clears throat> the aircraft were fueled and armed, ready for takeoff. Some pilots slept in their aircraft just to speed things along. Well, tour F 106, I can't remember which. Yeah, yeah they got one out of suffrage. Yeah. Sign plumes occurred in the, the Sioux, shattering windows, uh, cracking plaster. It was part of area life in the 60s. Aaron would only break the sound barrier if needed for the mission. Residents were advised that since the sign plume was not as loud as a bomb, so when you hear it at night, you can roll over and be thankful. <laughs> okay, <laughs> you say so. Another factor, the weather was terrible. One Kinslow crew recalled going out to an aircraft at 32 below to air temperature, 57 below wind chill, and picturing turning a uh, wrench on metal and those types of temperature. Thanks, but no thanks. Far northern bases, the snow could be so deep that aircraft taking off could not be seen until it lifted off above the snow walls lining the runway. SAC arrived at uh, the Michigan in the 50s and became the ADC host, ADC's host. This is a drawing of General Curtis LeMay, real architect of SAC through the 50s, believed relentless training and practice was essential to do the job right under high stress circumstances. They had a very uh, simple strategic plan in case we went to war, which was to leave the USSR a smoking radioactive room in two hours. So we, the Russians weren't fooling around, neither were we. Bases were dispersed throughout the U.S. to increase survivability in case of a Soviet first strike. 
Northern Michigan bases were appealing because of a shorter travel time to the Soviet Union over the North Pole. Kinshaw became a SAC base in 1959. Home to a wide range of fighters, bombers, maintenance and ground support units. Runaways were expanded about 12,000 foot long as the beach of the used a lot of real estate to take off and land. And in 1962, H models arrived and figured to carry nuclear weapons. All the Michigan bases were on high alert during uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis. And you can see the leadership of the three main players at that time. October 62, we learned of Russian missiles in Cuba, very tense deliberations in the U.S. and no doubt in the Soviet Union about how to respond. Military was a DEFCON 2 alert status. So next level is alert 1, which means nuclear war is either imminent or has begun. Long shifts, high pressure, lots of airmen were not that far removed from high school. So what these guys should have been thinking about was going to school, getting a job, their girlfriend, stuff like that. What they were looking at was the nuclear abyss. Major General E.G. Schuler was a lieutenant at the time of Texas and a B-52 base, but what he said could cover all the bases here. There were no train flights, no ground school, no nothing. We were cocked and ready to go to war. Yeah, that was not a long time. No. Cuba was short duration. Other assignments lasted for years. Crews participated in something called Operation Chrome Dome. Very long missions. We might fly up and above Greenland or over the North Pole, and if we got the signal, we would be heading on to Moscow and other targets in the Soviet Union. The missions were described as complex, challenging, and exhausting, and as for as big an airplane as a B-52 is, it's a tiny cockpit crew area, minimal comforts, it is a, uh, not a great way to travel, it is not Delta going down to Orlando. Yes, sir? During the 70s, uh, about, the, about the time that uh, 52 went down over Michigan. Uh, I had a chance to go to work in a, as part of a base tour for Air Force ROTC. Mm -hmm. And part of, the, part of the tour was a, uh, was a 52. We were inside it. You're right, it's very cramped in there. Yep. And the, uh, the one blessing at, at that point was the uh, 52s at that time, the tail gunner was not in the tail. Yeah, it was up in the video. Uh, which was a huge blessing in one way. But I had a chance to, at my preferred domicile uh, while I was in that plane, was at the tail gun seat. And it was a long crawl to get back there. A lot of instrumentation there. Yep. Yeah, if you're claustrophobic, you don't want this assignment. Uh, it's, it's a huge. Yep. The other thing I was going to say is that when you fly, see a 52 take off, uh, the wings drooped. In fact, they had to have a tail, uh, a, uh, yeah, a, tail a, a wheel yeah, on each wing, wing tip yep. to support the wings. And when, you, when the thing took off, you could almost you could see them as they go, and it, the wings would just go. <laughs> it's the time. The design work is still flying on them. It was, and I remember the whole lot out of, out of the air. Another we asshole when we went in there. Yeah. Uh, if, we, if, the, if the alarm went off, flatten yourself to a wall because they have they have no problem right away right over you. Yep. If you're a B-52 or tanker crewman, you're on alert duty for one week and then off and then on off that and on regular assignment for two weeks. Alert goal was to be airborne in 15 minutes if need be. Sometimes I've read accounts of B-52s getting air, airborne in 10 minutes. Crews worked, trained, ate, and slept together in what was called a crew readiness room, but more commonly known as a wall hole. And you could go to something like the base movie theater, but the classic went off, everybody had to go together, so you pile in the alert vehicle, sirens on, you're going rushing out to the flight line, you had a complete total right of way to get to that aircraft. Mm -hmm. And then what's going through your mind? Is this a drill? Or are we flying our Armageddon? And even if you survived the mission, which seemed like a pretty low probability event, what on earth would you be coming back to? In flight refueling, there's a, I've read somewhere, this is a pretty well known picture, but I think it was staged from what I've read, but it gives you the idea though. These guys were rushing out there, they weren't fooling around, getting to those aircraft. In flight refueling was critical. Boeing's KC 135s were used for years, it's a cousin of the Boeing 707 airliner. 
boom operator handles the refueling. Aircraft are flying at about 275 knots, maybe 20 to 35, 20 to 30 feet apart. It's going to be at night, bad weather, high wind, all three. So another high risk operation. In Vietnam, the tanker crews, such as those guys from Michigan bases, were credited with saves by refueling fighters and bombers so that those crews could avoid ejections or crashes over enemy territory. Refuelers were sometimes called TOADs by the crews. The acronym TOAD, T O A D, saying for take off and die, that the B 52 had to get whatever fuel it could to the B 52, and if it couldn't make it back home, too bad for you. In return, the tanker people called the bomber crews pukes. <laughs> Anyhow, Vietnam's ranking up in the mid 60s. All of Michigan SAC bases sent uh, crews to support Vietnam, and the B 52 missions began in. Uh, Mid 60s. The bases in Guam, Thailand, or Okinawa, as there was no Vietnam base big enough for a B 52. In December 1972, we saw a linebacker 2, which was President Nixon's effort to bring North Vietnam back to the negotiating table. 11 day air campaign, very intense, very controversial here in the U.S. Our POWs in Hanoi and similar places cheered when they heard the heavy bombing because they figured these bombs would be their ticket home, and that's exactly true. B-52, codenamed Ebony-2, was part of December, a December 26, 1972 mission. The F crew had been based at Kinchlow. Go to Captain Robert Morris, he's the guy on the right, he was the pilot. First Lieutenant Bob Hudson was a co-pilot. First Lieutenant Dwayne Barrow was a radar, was a navigator. Captain Michael Bow was a radar navigator. Uh, Major Nutter Wimbro, the third the guy on the left, was the EWO, the Electronic Warfare Officer. Tech Sergeant James Cook wasn't Kinslow base, he was a late ad. Rarely guy, it sounds like he got sick in the plane, so they evacuated him. And as the B-52s were warming up, they rushed the Cook out to the flight line. Anyhow, that morning in Thailand, where they were based, Wimber and Morris got their hair cut because they wanted to look good on Hanoi TV if they got shot down. <laughs> that bit of gallows seemed to didn't work out, though, because that night, three surface air missiles exploded near or on Ebony 2 over Hanoi. B-52 rolled over on its back. It must have been a horrifying experience to see it. Wimbro Morris died in the incident. Cook was severely injured on injection. He and the other surviving crew were repatriated home in 1973. There's photos from a 2009 memorial at Whiteman Air Force Base in Missouri as, uh, Mor as Morris was a Missouri native. The woman there was Nancy Morris Ox, who was uh, Captain Morris's widow, subsequently remarried. remarried. Linebacker 2 concludes on December 30th, 72. Harris, uh, the ceasefire was signed in North Vietnam on January 27th, 1973, and whatever you think of the war, Nixon's your business, but it, it got the war ended. Shortly after, the U.S. began bringing the POWs home, and our combat involvement concluded, leading to scenes such as this. This photograph known as Burst of Joy shows a reuniting of POW Lieutenant Colonel Robert Sturman's family. The tiger for Slava better when the Pulitzer was shot, and why not? It was a very well known photo of the war. Just one wrinkle. Sturman and his wife were soon divorced. He had been given a Dear John letter from, the, from his wife by the base chaplain a few days before the scene. Apparently, she was stepping out on him when it was a POW, so it was a mess. She's passed away a number of years ago. He's still pretty bitter about it from what I read in Book of Blame. Anyhow, UFOs, uh, we had a UFO incident up in the UP. Military flying was and is a high-risk profession. Accidents incurred involving personnel at all three bases. In November 1953, Air Defense Command spots an unidentified object in restricted airspace over Lake Superior near the Sioux Locks. An F-89 was scrambled. First Lieutenant Felix Monclaw, was the guy you see here, was flying. Second Lieutenant Robert Wilson was operating the radar. They followed this object, whatever it was, for 30 minutes, catch up to it at about 8,000 feet altitude. The blips converge on radar. The F-89 signal disappears. The F, whatever the object was, that disappeared from radar. No wreckage or human remains ever found. Can they recall up the Canadian military and they said, sorry, not ours. And it's something of an urban legend up in the UP that this was a UFO. In 1976, in September, another tragedy on a KC-135 tanker. 
20 people on board crashed near Hubbard Lake outside of Oscoda, 15 died. Believe there had been a pressurization problem on board. The flight originated at Sawyer, it's heading to Wordsmith, and then was going to fly on to Opadoff Air Force Base in Nebraska. This is from a 2016 reunion, 40 years after the tragedy of some of the survivors. Of course, it was an all military business on base. In 1975, President Ford landed at Kinslow on Air Force One. Helicopter over to Mackinac Island to meet with Governor Bill Milliken and greet some of the airmen on base. Personnel often had many good memories of their time on base, although airmen from the South might have a bit of an adjustment to winter scenes like this in Kinslow. <laughs> and there were relationships, marriages, lifelong friendships converged in their time here. Pete Stan was a crew chief at Kinslow. Know that given the bad weather, their isolation from big cities, everybody pulled together in Kinslow has shortly had a very high proficiency report because they, everybody supported everybody else. <laughs> Tons of <coughs> benefits <coughs> <coughs> excuse me, in the community, military and civilian jobs on base. There were about 3,200 military, 700 civilian jobs in Kinslow, so it was a big deal in these small towns up north to have these bases on. Elementary kids went to school on base, and the high school kids went to nearby Rudyard. Bases appeared in movies. Wordsmith was used to film 1948's Fire Squadron, Squadron with Edmund O'Brien and Robert Stack. And the right, some of Die Hard 2, Bruce Willis was filmed, filmed at Kinslow. Time passed, and things changed. Rafa was deactivated in 1972. Kinslow's closure was announced in 65 or 71. There was some political pushback, so it didn't close until 77. Sawyer and Wordsmith crews both participated in our complex with Iraq. Sawyer and Wordsmith, Sawyer and Wordsmith closed in the early 1990s along with many sack bases, very hard on the local economy, various efforts to rebuild and recover. Kinslow Airfield is now Chippewa International, which you can see here. Sawyer is now Marquette's airport. Wordsmith now houses Politics Air Maintenance, which is part of a big air freight business based on well run. So on, ongoing environmental concerns. The acronym PFAS, and this is a long chemical term that I'm going to try and pronounce, essentially represents chemical residue left in the soil and the water after years of the from firefighting agents, fuel, hydraulic fluids, all on base, all were used, and now it's all in the environment. I stayed in Oscoda in 2020. The hotel lobby had a sign saying, Don't eat fish caught in the Osawa River. Okay, no fish tonight. <laughs> Many accounts about long term health issues impacting both military personnel and area residents. Lots of frustration in the local community. It's very expensive to clean up. Taking years to complete, no obvious end in sight. These three people are volunteers at the St. Francis Community Center in Gwynn, which is a town south of Marquette where Sawyer was based. Areas had a very hard time with poverty, unemployment, and drug use. There's some progress that's been made, some real retail return, some kind of has been built. There are many boarded up properties, abandoned properties. Uh, it's, apparently, in Kinslow, things are a little bit better. There's a 40-year uh, anniversary article in 2017 noted that it was pretty in there, at least in the newspaper view, a reasonably successful con conversion from military to civilian life. The area has some prisons. So, but they're using it as jobs, you got those guys someplace, so, so it goes. Some good news, Northern Michigan will be used for space operations impacting all three areas with the potential for 40,000 jobs. Well, spread out over 10 years, at least from what I've read, at least Sometimes economic assumptions tend to be rosier than they actually plan out, but you know, good salaries, a lot of jobs, the area needs it. Michigan Aerospace Manufacturers Association announced that Kinslow site was selected as a command and control center for satellite launching. They want to build launch sites in the lake in Marquette County. Here's an artist rendition of what that might look like, and an Scoto Wordsmith. There's some concerns from local environmental groups because it's a beautiful shoreline. If you folks have been up there on vacation or traveling, it's a beautiful shoreline. Now you're going to have heavy jobs, noise, and equipment. So you can decide for yourself what the appropriate trade off is. It's a tremendously interesting history. How do you keep the story alive? Charlotte Williamson was 50 years ago. Sack bases closed 30 to 45 years ago. Memories fade. There's no Kinslow Air Museum at all. 
There are small museums at Wordsmith and at K.I. Sawyer. People such as Judy and Chuck Schuler at Wordsmith and Lanny Duquette at uh, Sawyer are doing a great job of maintaining this history. Both are staffed by dedicated volunteers dealing with limited resources, both well worth visiting, just like this museum here is well worth visiting. So I try to think how to wrap it up, because there's somewhat disparate stories. Everything ties back to SAC, but one's a nine person tragedy, and Michigan SAC bases, very different history. To me, though, all played part of winning the Cold War. This is a photograph of the Berlin Wall coming down in 1989, so it's certainly a worthwhile outcome. And in a broader sense, and what I try to bring across in the book, Michigan and its people have made huge contributions to aviation, military, and civilian over decades. I'm glad to share a few of these stories with you today. Any questions for me? Yeah, good. I'll take the applause. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Do you take square? Okay, I, I guess I have one question. Uh, do you have one question? There were four air bases in the country, in, in the state. You didn't touch uh, Selfridge at all. Selfridge, to my knowledge, wasn't a strategic air command base. In True. ABC, you're right, Selfridge is in the book. It's, it's uh, you know, there's a time limit on the presentation. They're all great stories, and I originally developed this for a uh, North presentation. I'm actually working on a subsequent presentation for later next year on Willow Run, where I volunteer. And it's, it's own history, but it, it's hard to pick any one story because they're all worthwhile. Yeah. Well, the reason I bring up so, uh, Selfridge is because also, uh, out of all the Air Force bases, major Air Force bases that were around in uh, like the 60s and 70s, Selfridge was the uh, oldest one, the first one. Yeah. That was uh, that was established back in 1917. Uh, so I, I was kind of curious about that one too. But uh, you, you mentioned Strategic Air Command. One of the top commanders of the Eighth Air Force was a classmate of mine back at the University of Detroit. His name was Bob Elder. Well, the name rings a bell. General Robert J. Elder. I'm not to look him up. Uh, actually, Lieutenant General. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, he retired, what, uh, 2000, I think? Somewhere in the area. 2000, 2010. But uh, everyone's a character, too. Everyone's got a story. And they really are, but they're general, privates, drafties, volunteers, any branch of the service, we've all got worthwhile stories. Well, thanks for your time. The books, the Michigan Aviation books are on Amazon for 19. I'll sell it to you today for 15. I've got change, I'll take a check, but I don't have a square, sorry to say. That's gonna be gonna be next year's uh, project to get that. We throw in Yankee Air Museum, I'll sell them both to you for both of them for 30. So all right. Drive safe. Maybe the lines can win. <laughs> now you got to visit me, but so uh, we'll say thank you for coming. I appreciate it. <coughs> thank you, sir. Oh, you good? Thank you. Oh, well, yeah. You brought back some memories. <laughs> I was up with, uh, I was up with